So without much further ado, we've got Reed Smith, who's recently elected TD in Ireland. <laughs> Campaign. Thanks very much and thanks for the warm welcome. Um, I suppose just being a TD it means that you get invited to all sorts of things. That light is terrible, isn't it? Um, you get invited to all sorts of things and all sorts of things you don't want to go to. But I'm very proud to be here tonight. I like the title, Lexit, because I'm sick of listening to Brexit. It's become a huge issue all over Ireland, believe it or not. And the latest thing I got invited to was this event that is happening um, in BBC now. What date is today? Tomorrow. It's happening tomorrow. And it's been organised by a legal company, their legal advisors to the banks, called McCann Fitzgerald. Now, I was going over this book, uh, this is a very good book called Austerity Ireland, written by Brian O'Boyle and Kieran Allen tonight. And McCann Fitzgerald torn up in it as the legal firm who supported the banks to draft legislation for the Dáil, uh, this was before the banks went bust, which allowed the banks to issue covered bonds, in other words, to uh, uh, issue bonds and borrow and loan money to twice the size of the Irish economy during the Celtic Tiger. Money they didn't have, but IOUs and bonds were, not, were, were issued all over the place. And this piece of legislation was later described by the European Union as a benchmark for legislation that they uh, brought in to issue a huge amount of credit for um, from British and German banks, British and German banks and French banks that we are now indebted to for four, uh, sorry, 68 billion euro that annually we pay back uh, 9 billion a year in interest alone. That's just the Irish Free State. Um, and I want to talk a little about the impact that that has had on our country, on our people, and on the working class and the unemployed and the marginalised in particular. But it's also very interesting to see that the likes of um, McCann and Fitzgerald are advocating a, a, a no vote to Brexit. They don't want us to leave. They don't want us to vote for a, an exit from the EU. I wonder why. The EU has been very nice to McCann and Fitzgerald. In fact, I would argue that they're probably a strong arm of the, of, of, of the bank and the legal section of the European Union overall. The other person who is very interesting to see is on the radio every day, is organising mobilisations, is coming over here on a speaking tour, I believe, to tell the Irish diaspora uh, not to vote for an exit, is Michael O'Leary of Ryanair. The same geezer, the same geezer who has fought tooth and nail to keep trade unions out of his airline. He took the uh, pilots to the Supreme Court on the basis of their desire to organise themselves into a trade union. And I remember the night when the baggage handlers shut down Dublin Airport when uh, Ryanair um, boss Michael O'Leary uh, refused to acknowledge their right to be in a trade union. The outcome of that is another story, a major sellout by the union leaders themselves. But nevertheless, somebody who has battled vigorously to keep workers' rights uh, off the agenda who makes vast profits, as you all know, and who exploits hugely uh, the, the workers in the company and indeed the customers. Not that long ago, he was actually very critical of the European Union and called them a dictatorship because they tried to impose certain rules in Brussels airport and in France airport on, 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 the, um, on the levies that he was charging, or wasn't paying in the airport, I should say, the local levies. So there's somebody else speaking out of both sides was men who, who passionately does not want you guys to exit from the EU. They're queuing up, loads of them, and uh, they're queuing up on uh, the Irish boss class, many of them who've been invited to this conference that I'm going to miss tomorrow, unfortunately, God help me. And uh, one of the ones that is queuing up to also tell you is not to exit is the former chairman of the Labour Party in Ireland. These people are so behoven and so grovelling towards the European Union institutions, the ECB, the, uh, the, the IMF, what we call the Troika, which came into the country and bailed us out to the tune of 84 billion and are now taking, I mentioned earlier on, 9 billion a year in interest alone from, uh, from, from the Irish people. And that will continue until 2054. So there's a whole generation and the following generation who are now living and will be born, who will have a huge debt on their shoulders from the time uh, they draw breath in, 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 the, in the Irish Republic. 
And the outcome of that has meant very, very, very severe uh, social decline and social uh, punishment on, on, on the Irish people. I'll just go through, through a few of them. And probably some of the worst are actually what the Minister for Finance described as picking the low-hanging fruit. Some of the most despicable uh, and cheap shots at the most vulnerable in society. You know Ireland has a, a, a travelling population, a travelling community of about 30,000 people, maybe between 30 to 40,000 people, give or take. There are special education um, facilities put into local schools to assist the travellers who have a, a much higher rate of ill health, a much higher rate of, of, of educational disadvantage, seven times the suicide rate among traveller men that it is among the general population, real problems, real social problems, and the traveller support that was put in to assist young children to develop and be able to educate and escape from that trap was cut by 86%. Traveller accommodation was cut, uh, was cut by 80% and very recently five young children died in a fire in an overcrowded camp on the south side of Dublin. There have been evictions on traveller halting sites all over the country because of overcrowding. Traveller support has been devastated and this is what Michael Noonan called picking the low hanging fruit. Another very vulnerable group who have been attacked in order to pay this 9 uh, billion per year back to the uh, Troika to the European Union and the very wealthy German, French and British banks and institutions are lone parents. Lone parents, uh, probably all over the world, suffer disadvantage. Their children are more disadvantaged than the children of, of, of couples due to the lack of childcare, the expense of childcare, the difficulty in, in, in paying rent <coughs> and in accessing housing. And lone par the children of lone parents are impoverished at 22% of child poverty is among children of lone parents. That has increased massively to about 30% because the government brought in measures at the behest of the Troika, I'll just repeat it again, a combination of the European Union, the IMF and the, uh, the, the European Central Bank. They sat down and made these plans to pick the low hanging fruit in order to pay back the debt. And uh, lone parents have had their income slashed They've been told to go out and get a job or they get a slap across the neck and many of them have not been able to secure the 19 hours minimum required by the Troika forcing them out to work and have therefore in many cases have pulled back from doing the 5, 10 or 12 hours that they have and are further uh, driven into poverty. People who are at work have had their wages slashed. Public servants by anything between 23 and 30% over the course of the bank bailout. In the private sector, it's between 15 and 20%. Public servants have also had a pension-related deduction, uh, a levy uh, of 8% imposed on their wages. And we now have, um, on top of that, uh, the cuts to the dole for young people. If you're under 25, you will be severely discriminated against and will be, have lost 100 euro a week from uh, unemployment benefit. That brings you down to about 80 euro a week, which means that you're going to be forced into living with mummy and daddy in overcrowded <coughs> situations, um, and you're going to be forced further still into taking up what we call job scam, which are like, um, what, what do they call them, internships, where you get 50 euro a week or 20 euro a week for doing a full-time job on top of your dole. So young people are being massively discriminated against, and on top of that, they brought in all new starting pay rates for teachers, for guardi, guardi or police, uh, and for nurses in particular, all beginning uh, on, on, on lower starting rates of about 20,000 euro a year. Now, at the same time as you're seeing all these cuts to wages and people having to work harder, there's tables there, I won't go into them, but you can look them up, that show that um, your, uh, Irish workers are more, more productive, the, the level of productivity has soared while the wages have been hit, um, and at the same time you're seeing that uh, we're also witnessing a huge amount of people in dire straits for housing. Ironically, it was the housing bubble that caused the crash, that forced us into the arms of the Troika, and the housing bubble has not abated. Rents are rising sky high, uh, people are being evicted from their homes, there are every day, day in, day out, more and more families joining the homeless list and having to stay in hotels or bed and breakfast or hostel accommodation, including thousands of children who then have to go to school from, the, from these conditions. So it's been a disaster. 
but it's been a disaster that was contributed to by the reckless lending of the greedy and uh, irresponsible financial institutions of Germany, France, Britain and right across the European Union. And the Irish people, ordinary people, are paying the highest price. We're paying a higher price per head of the population than the Greeks, the Portuguese or the Spanish. And that's not to say, check them, that's actually to show solidarity with them. And I think the best thing that could happen to us is that all of these countries and yourselves pull away from the EU. This is not a social Europe. This is not a club for yeah. us. It's a club for idea that this would be, be a, a, a social alternative to uh, repeated wars in Europe, that it would uh, you know, create solidarity among all the nations, that it would give people the right to travel, that it would lift all boats, that we would get equal pay, that we would get uh, abortion rights, that we would get social equality. Anything we have achieved in terms of pay or equality, and it isn't a huge amount, but including marriage equality and the decriminalisation of homosexuality, we still don't have abortion rights, despite what the EU say to Ireland all the time. They still haven't recognised a woman's right to choose to control our own bodies, either north or south of the border. Nevertheless, anything we have achieved, we have to fight for, and we have to fight to retain. The EU have handed us nothing. They have taken from us and for them to argue now that the sky will fall in if you guys leave, I think is like they threatened us when we voted no to Nice and they made us vote again. When we voted no to Lisbon and they made us vote again. I don't think they'll make you vote again because your ruling class is very divided on this issue. Our ruling class was a thousand percent behind each of these measures to yeah, create more punitive, uh, more punitive issues and put more pressure on Irish workers and on the unemployed and on the most marginalised. I've been asked to sum up, there's loads more I'd like to say, but really I think what says it all about Europe is the refugee crisis. My God almighty, how do they justify calling themselves any sort of a union when they treat human beings in the way that they have? When they have done this deal with Turkey to push tens of thousands of desperate people back into the arms of one of the most despotic regimes in the world. How dare they call themselves uh, humanitarian? <laughs> and this will differentiate uh, the Brexit from the Brexit voice. We have to say, none of these deals with Turkey, open the borders, let them in, and treat every human being as an equal, regardless of where they come from.